Hey everybody, welcome back. Lecture nine, we're gonna be wrangling some data. We're gonna talk about uh, various manipulations of data that are going to be very, very common parts of a data scientist's life. So before we get into the fun stuff, let's just do the reminders. Um, the quiz on the Moultring proposal paper is due this Friday. You're going to see the quiz on Canvas on Thursday at 12.01 a.m. Uh, another bigger exam, the, the actual first midterm, is going to be next Monday. So uh, we are going to do a study review here in lecture and also in the discussion section on Friday. So you'll have two components to that. We'll cover some of it here and some of it in discussion. Um, the next bit of business is that it is time to get into groups for project for, for the final project and for assignment number one. Now, uh, assignment number one is a rough draft of the final project report. It is going to be a very rough draft in a lot of ways, okay? You don't have to actually have it all done. But just so you know, the week after the final, after the final, the week after the midterm, so mid midterms Monday the 26th, that next week and the week after, so almost two weeks basically, are going to be yours to work on that rough draft of the final project report. Okay, so basically two weeks after the final, well, uh, two work weeks, two five days, and the weekend in between. So uh, obviously we need to get everybody in groups because you need to be working on it right after the exam on Monday. So please register. If you have not already registered a group, if you have formed a group, go to the Google form that you can see the link here. You can also find the link on Canvas in the announcement, okay? Click on it, tell us who your group mates are, one entry in the form per group, please. All right. If you do not have a group registered on the Google form by the end of Thursday this week, the 22nd, then we are going to arbitrarily assign you groups. All right. Now it's on to the fun stuff. So we're going to describe tabular data best practices. And those are often encapsulated in these principles called tidy data. And we'll tell you exactly what that is. We're also going to demonstrate both how to deal with generally bad data, and at least conceptually, and we're also going to demonstrate to you how the tidy data uh, principles help solve a lot of the problems of wrangling data. So before we get all the way in, let's check what you've learned from reading number one. So there will be a little pop-up for you to do the Google form. Please take a look at it now and tell us what you recall of the 50 years of data science, and specifically about the science of data science. All right. So. This is data wrangling, and uh, it's not quite as mm, iconic, I guess, or at least vibrantly awesome looking as uh, wrangling cows, but uh, it's the same metaphor, right? You've got you've to gotta rope them, throw and brand them, to quote the song lyric. You've got to get a hold of the data. You've got to force it to do what you want it to do. And that is what data wrangling really is. So another quick quiz question for you. What percentage of your time, if you're a working data scientist, do you think is spent doing data wrangling? That is just grabbing data and making sure it's in a format you can actually do something with, right? Not doing the analysis, but just getting it into the place where you can operate on it. So 
The answer to that question depends on who's asking it, but you see a lot of surveys that say anywhere between 60 and 90% of a working data scientist's time may be spent in data wrangling, not in the analysis part. And, you know, in some senses, this is annoying because oftentimes the fun comes in discovery and discovery happens at the analysis stage. But there is a sense in which this is the important part of the work. This is what can't be uh, algorithmically fixed so far in this world, right? This requires a human to do it, and it requires a human who knows data, who knows the ways in which you can mess this up, who knows and understands how to use certain tools to, uh, to fix the problem. It's a little bit like working with your hands, right? I don't know if you have a, a craft hobby or something like that, but it's, it can be very mechanical, but very soothing. And it's important to do it skillfully or else the artistry part of everything just kind of can't happen. Well, what do we mean? Why is it hard to deal with data? I mean, it's just numbers, right? It's in a computer, you just use them. The problem is, is that it's not just numbers. It's that data comes to you in all kinds of crazy ways. This is a, an example that uh, we called from a blog that um, so Australia had their own kind of reckoning with the whole gay marriage thing in 2017. And there was a big survey across uh, all Australian voters about what they thought about this proposal to uh, to enable gay marriage. And the Australian government published an official results and set of data. And so what if you were trying to operate on this data? What if you were trying to do some sort of analysis about how Australian voters felt about marriage equality? Well, since this is what the data looks like, it's a big Excel spreadsheet. And as soon as you see Excel spreadsheet, you can already be afraid because um, these are tools used by people who are not data scientists. Data scientists have to work with Excel, but nobody wants to use it because it's a horrifying uh, replacement for a pretty piece of paper, right? And it's going to read more like a book, which is unstructured data quite a lot of the time, than it is going to read like something like a database where you can easily program a way to solve a problem, right? When the data is structured, writing a program to solve something is easy. You just have to understand the structure and then it's easy to write the program and there's no exceptions or special cases or hey wait wait check if okay but spreadsheets spreadsheets are the devil's work they are they make it very easy for people to put in stuff that makes a computational analysis difficult so the main one of the main problems with, uh, with these kinds of things is the so-called chart junk or table junk, right? Just things that are not data. They're just there for people to read. And more to the point, they're irregular. So most of the programming that uses tabular data, it's looking for something like this. It's looking for a dense table where there's columns which represent variables and rows which represent some sort of entry, some sort of data sample or observation, okay? And, and this stuff, this can be read. This is like data and then we can grab it with a computer program and we can, we can you know, know what the different age groups are and we can index by them and grab data by year of age and all that kind of stuff, okay? But when that's buried inside of something like this, you have to get rid of this stuff, right? And that is going to be different on every single Excel spreadsheet you ever find. Um, then there's going to be things like this, where you have like merged cells and, and things that are like important keynotes that you may need to know, but you have to reference from here to here, which you can do with your eyeballs, but you need to know 
you know, how to do that computationally. There's no one way to fix that problem. <clears throat> so here's more raw data. Here is a summary, right, which is a pain in the butt because there's summarized data and then there's more raw data and you have to know which chunk of this is which. Anything which has blank lines is going to be a not available, an NA, okay? And when you get NAs in the middle of things, it can cause you to accidentally have a blank row in your data if you don't index things right. You'll end up thinking this is data and that it's blank instead of it's just white space to make something pretty for a human eye. So you can see spreadsheets are not good ways for us to get data that we want to operate on. And yet, because data scientists are always interacting with regular human beings, regular human beings love this kind of format because it helps them read the data. It doesn't help computers read the data. So this is why we spend so much time data wrangling, because all the business managers in the world want to see this, and so all the organizations in the world create data that way. All right, so our job as data wranglers, yippee ki is to transform this into some regular format that computer programs can operate on and get answers out of. So since data science is the scientific process of extracting some sort of value from all these numbers, what are your job duties? Well, it's going to be collecting, cleaning, and organizing data sets is going to be job one. And like I said, most data scientists find they spend a significant portion of their time doing this kind of a job. Once we've got that, we can build those data models and we can answer those questions and make the presentations and beautiful charts and everything like that that are also expected of data scientists, right? Remember, you are a communicator. You're not just an ingester of data or a manager of data. You're going to be also building the models that answer questions. And then you're going to have to tell people what you have found. And being a good communicator is also part of this. So because of that, you have to be entirely comfortable working with tabular data. Tabular data, again, especially in the business world, is going to be very common. And also, I would say, in the science world, like if you work like I did for a long time in a scientific organization, biologists like Excel spreadsheets too because they're human beings, not computer programmers. Sorry, I didn't mean to insult computer programmers by implying we are not human beings. We're just different ones. All right, so we need some vocab. We need to be able to talk about different kinds of tabular data and what it looks like. Well. Here's tabular data. Um, we're showing it to you in a spreadsheet form because it's easy to visualize. Right, we've got columns are variables and rows are observations or samples. Oh, well, here comes my uh, animated spreadsheet, uh, my animation on the spreadsheet. So each one of these is a variable name especially if you're doing something machine learning oriented, people might call variables features. It basically means the same thing with the added caveat that a feature could be a transformation of a variable. It could be taking the variable and putting it in a numerical format, which is better for the machine learning algorithm. Okay, but fundamentally variables and features mean the same thing. They're the, the names on these columns, okay? And each one of these rows is an observation. And in this case, the ID is a unique ID for every single observation. So this number is never going to repeat down this column. All right, and we can talk about different types of data, right? So you might have a table which is demographics, which has people's uh, sexes and their locations and their occupations. And you might have another 
table, which involves the same people, but it's doctor's office data, right? So it's like height and insulin, and blood glucose, and all that kind of thing. Okay. What is, way I left that in the wrong place. What is tidy data? So we're not just interested in data, we're interested in tidy data. So importantly, each variable is it's in a column. You're not going to see variables on split up between columns. You're not going to see variables happening on the rows. Each variable you measure has got its own column. Every observation or sample is going to be a row. You're not going to see observations split among multiple rows or randomly in the columns or something like that. Okay, and there should be a completely separate table for each type of data. So the demographic survey stuff is in this Excel spreadsheet, and the doctor's office is in that SQL table, this SQL table. Okay, they're not going to be together. So if you have multiple tables, then there's a good idea is to include, you know, and they're related things, things that you want to do an analysis across them, like we've talked about in the uh, SQL joins, right? You need a unique identifier, something which can line up Jane Smith from here as being the same Jane Smith whose height is 65 inches. Okay? So, data is rectangular, all right? So what do we mean by that? We, we want to make sure that we don't have any kinds of, again, like columns down here in the rows. We don't have any variables in the rows. Each one of these is an observation. And we want to make sure that we have the ability to um, make sure that this is a consistent data structure, okay? that we don't have missing stuff happening here, that we don't have any kinds of uh, misappropriated variable names, that everything is clear and tidy. So what does tidy data really mean, right? It's a consistent data structure. So the structure is the same, even if the data is different. The important part of that structure is it lets us develop tools that are going to be able to operate on all these different data sets as long as these data sets are, are tidy in their format. Okay? And it means that you only have to learn a few things instead of having to learn different tools for each different weird format of data. And it's also really good for combining data sets. Okay? So what is a good spreadsheet in Tidyland? Right? It has to be consistent. You have to choose good names for things. You have to write dates in the preferred ISO format. You shouldn't have any empty cells, those rows of blank stuff. Just one thing in a cell. Don't use font color to get data because that's not going to be machine readable easily. And you have to be able to save the data as a plain text file for operation on. Okay? So what do we mean by all these little tick boxes, right? So this should always be called ID. It shouldn't sometimes be called ID, sometimes called ID number, sometimes called student ID. Every table, it should be called only ID. The variable names should be consistent across the spreadsheets. Um, the data, so in these data, sex is always specified as female or male. Pick one way to code it and stick with it. Don't do female in one place and F in another. All right? Choose good names. Make sure that the name is descriptive, right? Doctor visit one, right? It's much more descriptive than F1, whatever that is. I think I shared some data with people the other day, showed you in, I can't remember if it was office hours. Yeah, it was office hours. I showed calorie data. Um, and uh, you could see that like BL1 was totally a code for a doctor's visit. And they were like, what is that? Okay, so 
Um, and also, you know, stick to the naming routines we've talked about using underscores. Make sure that, you know, you have consistent uh, entries that you don't have like extra spaces here. Mail with a space is a different entry than mail without a space afterwards. ISO standard dates. Yes, please. Please, please, please. Get rid of these empties. Whenever you do that kind of stuff, you're creating huge problems for somebody trying to read the data. Just one thing in a cell, put the number, put in the variable name that it's in pounds, okay? If you put in this stuff, somebody who wants to actually find out what the average weight of all these people is, is gonna have to operate on this and remove this LBS and then because that means this is a string instead of a number, they're going to have to convert the, <clears throat> the character set 180 into the number 180 and get rid of those LBS, and it's going to be a big pain in the butt. So make sure that just one thing is in each cell. Many, uh, many algorithms and Software pipelines will have a very difficult time knowing what to do with a highlighted color, even if it's obvious to human eyes. Don't do that. Name things well. Make sure that you've got all these things we've talked about, about being consistent, about what means what you're going to do. Watch out for spelling errors. Oh my gosh, the spelling errors I have found. Right? Naming conventions need to be totally rigid. Insulin growth factor one, IGF one, or IGF dash one, or dot one, or slash one. It's a nightmare. It really is. I, you will have these recurring dreams. Trust me. Okay, but as a data scientist, at least you can make sure you don't create data sources that have these problems, even if you're going to have to deal with other people's problems coming at you. Okay, I'll let you take a look at that on your own time. But uh, in the meantime, let's talk about some of these common problems, ways in which people create, quote, messy data instead of tidy data. So some of the common problems we have is that headers are values, but they really should be variable names. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you an example here in just one second. Okay. Um, Single column has multiple variables, right? Where you like try to cram in multiple things into a single column. You, you can easily imagine that case. <clears throat> uh, variables have been entered in both rows and columns. I'm gonna show you an example in the very next slide of one and three. Um, multiple types of data in the same spreadsheet. Um, mixing and matching, right? Doctors, disc stuff and demographic stuff. And a single observation stored across multiple spreadsheets is uh, another pain in the butt thing. Okay. This is probably the single most common form of messy data. So here's some data on, uh, you know, how many people from each religion have a given uh, income. Okay. It doesn't matter what the data is or where it comes from, but what we see here is that if you are an atheist in this set of people, 12 atheists made very little money and 70 atheists made a big chunk of change, right? So what we have here are actually three variables, okay? We have a variable of religion, we have a variable of income, and we have a number which happens to be how many people are in that category. Okay, so again, going back over here, column headers are values. Oops, that's what we're having there, right? And we have variables in the rows and the columns. We have one and three in this data. Well, how do we make it tidy? So if we look at just a slice here, the agnostics, okay? So what we have here are three variables. Remember, religion, income, and a number, frequency. So 
we should have three columns. So we have the agnostic religion, the income is 10, less than 10k, and this is the number we get. Okay, And we have all the way down those columns and several other columns that were not here for space. And that's how the tidy data set is going to look. And then obviously it would go on. It would You would see the same split for atheist and Buddhist and Catholic. And this list grows longer and longer and longer. All right, so that is how people fail to make tidy data and what tidy data should look like. So let's give a little quiz. Did I describe it well enough for you to understand which ones of these is the right way to make a spreadsheet? Please click and answer. Okay, so again, we are going to see this kind of thing over and over and over again. You will get so sick of these kinds of spreadsheets. We have the merged column headings, right? So you have to actually like, you know, this was the column heading right here, this top row, but here we've split it up and it's like, you know, all comes underneath this one Uber heading, but what we really want is the second row there as the variable names. That's a huge pain in the butt. So you have attributes spanning multiple rows without an ID spanning. So the idea is that you're supposed to fill in this stuff. So like these rows, you just have to assume that this drops down and fills in to make the unique tidy data set so you should be like filling these with the last value whenever you have uh, NAs in there. So you have names and addresses spanning multiple lines so you've got to go across the lines and pull it in to be a single observation. Right? So all these things that for human eyes it's fine we just deal with it but computers eyes no, computers only do exactly what you tell them. And if you have to write 1,824, uh, you know, modifications on a standard program to get this data in, you're going to go insane. So, and as we, uh, as I often say, na 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 na, that should be hey hey goodbye about here, right? So you just get sick of the same problems over and over again. So again, this is our job. A first step of almost every data science project is dealing with this untidy data and putting it into a nice tidy table. Okay, I do want to emphasize that tidy is not the same as clean, okay? So tidy is a kind of clean. You can have clean data that is not tidy. All right, how would that work? Well, you know, if we have situations like this where we have what are essentially, right, these are variables across the columns again, just like we looked at a minute ago with the agnostic and atheist and so forth and the, uh, the income, right? So in this case, it's an age band. So age band is a variable and it's right across there. So, we could remove all these commas, which choke, you know, we don't want commas in our numbers, we just want the numbers stored as floating points or integers or whatever they need to be stored as, okay? And we could remove all these na 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 nas all the way across, and we could remove the chart junk and get rid of that. We could just have these tables right here. That would be clean data because we move, removed all the NAs and we removed all the chart junk and we had it in a table, but the table was not in tidy format, okay? We didn't break out all these things that are across multiple columns into a single column. Capiche? All right. 
So, all right. So again, we're going to do this all through our careers. We're we're taking all those uh, the text out of the Jane Austen books like we used in a previous example, right? We know that we have to get all that text and we have to create tidy data out of it. We have to have, you know, the frequency of a word, whether frequency of good words, right? And which novel and uh, how many of them we have, right? In order to create these narrative uh, sentiment graphs that we talked about back in, I don't remember, was that like, Lecture three, whatever. You know, we have a website we've been scraping. We need to scrape it into tidy data format in order to produce the results. Okay? Because all the tools that we're going to use to do analyses and visualizations are probably going to assume tidy inputs. So we get those song lyrics and we we throw the the information from the song and the artist and the release date and we throw it in here. So this is the, remember, this is the compressibility of song lyrics. How compressible are they? If they're highly compressible by the zip algorithm, then they're probably fairly repetitive. Okay. So what about actually working with the tabular data? What about doing analysis with it? Okay, once we've got it in a good, tidy tabular format, what's kind of like the next steps before we actually get to do some sort of numerical analysis. So we often use a set of jargon to describe common operations on tabular data. These kinds of operations are, they're not actually doing the analysis, they're once again taking the data sources and putting them in the right form to do the analysis. These are operations that already depend on tabular tidy data. So we've got it this far along the path, but we need to do a few more things before doing a regression or trying to see what the statistics of something is. Okay? So these, these um, jargon methods, these verbs of uh, tabular data, are commonly things like subset. We want to take a chunk of the data set, not all of the data. So we're going to filter out rows or filter in rows, right? We're going to take a little bit of the data. We're going to filter out the rest of it, okay? We want to grab particular columns, particular variables, and we don't need the rest of the variables. We only want to operate on these variables in the data set. So filter is about rows, observations, Select is about columns. They are the same operation. They're both subsets, okay? So we're gonna get a small chunk of the bigger rows by filtering, and we're gonna get a small chunk of the bigger columns by selecting. We might need to do things like reorder, okay? We might need to sort or arrange, okay? So that we see like Chronologically, first this, then that, then that, then that, then that. Okay, that's our arrangement, a reordering of the rows. And we generally will probably also talk about a reordering of the columns. Okay, we might need to add new variables. So maybe we have, um, you know, data in a very raw form, but we also want to add in a processed form of the same data, right? So maybe we have like somebody's weight and we have it at, you know, in January and February and March and April. And maybe what we want is not just their current weight, but also like a smoothed version of that weight, like a kind of the average over the last three months. Okay. Because weight fluctuates really fast, right? We can change weight in like on the order of like four or five pounds in a single day just by what we eat and drink and eliminate, okay? So maybe we want to smooth the weight measurements out over time. So we have the measurements in January, February, and March, and we have the last three months, uh, what's called a moving average over the last three months attached to each one of those. That's an example. And we want to summarize the data. Uh, and when we summarize data, 
we might do something like, let's see what the average height is of all the women in the data set. Okay, so we want to group by gender, and then we can find the average height. Okay, we will talk about these uh, in clear examples using the data set we've already been talking about, the Great British Bake Off. Okay, reminder, this is a show about baking, and it uh, involves lots of individual challenges where the chefs try to do their very best to outdo each other in different kinds of uh, contests. It's got 10 seasons of data and we've got uh, this kind of data format. We've got a ratings table which is indexed by series and episode and contains information on people watching. We've got a contest results so on each episode, did somebody go on to the next episode or did they get eliminated? So Anitha was, went in from episode one to episode two, and then on episode two, she was eliminated. Okay. And then she doesn't appear in the further episodes of that series. Okay. We've got uh, information on the equivalent US and UK seasons and air dates. We've got information on each baker and what their signature, uh, you know, bakery product is and what they did in terms of a, a, a challenge in a given episode, okay? How well they did. This is a ranking, whether they were first, second, third, or so forth in a given challenge, okay? And we also have a separate demographics table. So these are the same bakers we were just looking at but this table contains information on their age, their occupation, where they come from, right? So again, we have these tables. This is the summary view of the tables. And somebody gives us a task. Our task is we need to take the baker's table and we want to join it and get some combination information where we want to add demographic stuff from that baker's table to information about, say, their technical challenges. Okay? So this is what it looks like, right? Here's the challenges data. We have the baker by first name and their challenges information. Here's that demographics table. We have the baker by full name and all that stuff. And we want to combine these two bits of data with this bit of data. How do we do that? Well, we have the baker's name here and the baker's name here, but there's an important thing. If you want to line up this entry with this entry, uh, we need to parse out that last name and know that this is Anitha from series one, Anitha from series one, and we have to match it up that way. So what we're doing is we have to mutate this full name column so that we get a version which is only the first name. And then we need to line them up on that first name. So we're going to mutate the baker's full name into a first name only column. Okay? Then we can line stuff up. So here's a different uh, task for you. What if we want to understand the results of the challenges once we do that? So we've used the thing we just did. We now have a composite table which contains both challenges information and bakers. Now we need to operate on that. We want to find out um, how many challenges each baker in the series won. Okay, so we're going to group by series and baker. So Anitha in series one is the unit we're looking for. We're asking how many challenges did Anitha in series one win? How many challenges did Ed in series one win? So on and so forth across every person in each series. Okay, and we want to sort it out by series. So what does this look like? Something like this. We've joined together the results like we talked about using the first name. 
okay? We had to mutate to get that first name. Now we want to group by each person, so there's only one person per series on each one of these rows, okay? And these columns are summaries of the data. They're summaries of the challenges in various ways that we have created, okay? So again, a closer zoom in on what I was just saying a minute ago. We want to group by Anitha, find all the entries of Anitha, and we want to summarize, say, uh, what, what was her average place, her average rank in the technical challenge. So, you know, in, in the uh, first episode, she was second place, and in the second episode, she was seventh place. So her average is 4.5, you know, 9 divided by 2, right? That's her average place is 4.5. So that's what we're after here. These kinds of operations, they are your bread and butter. They are the things that, you know, even after you have clean and tidy data, you're going to need to do things like this a thousand times a day in order to make an analysis work. Okay? So if you're a huge Series 3 fan, what if you only want to work with Series 3 data? Well, we have to do those subsetting operations we were talking about, right? We have to filter out only the rows that contain Series 3 and get rid of everything else. Okay, another reason you might do uh, various kinds of subsetting is what if you find out that you've done these operations to create the summary of Baker and Series, and it just looks really weird, right? Like you're you're rather suspicious that um, the uh, you know that the median rank of this person could be three when their highest placing was one and their lowest placing was ten. It seems weird to you, right? Okay, so we want to double check. We want to go back and look at the raw data. So let's just grab the raw data instead of looking because we suspect our summary might be messed up. We probably did something wrong, and we want to double check by eye. So we're going to select out all those columns, and we're going to sort them. We're going to sort them by series episode so that we can run down the side here and see, okay, for a given, I forget even who this was, uh, Brendan. Ha, Brendan's not even in the data view that I have right here. Okay, but whatever, you get the idea. So we're going to look for that person. We're going to sort things out by series and episode. And then we can check, you know, whether whether there was a winner, how many, uh, yeah, how many bakers appeared. So that, like, if you want to know, like, how could they possibly have been, like, 12th place, right? Did Natasha from Tamworth appear only in episodes that had at least 12 bakers, okay? All right, and the answer to that is yes, Natasha appeared uh, in an episode where there were 12 bakers, which is a ridiculously high number. All right, so we joined everything. We got both data sets together. We select only the columns we want, series and episode, and then we arrange on those we, we sort it by series and episode so we can do our by eye inspections, okay? And then we can do various other operations on there like mutation and so forth. All right, why is having this kind of tidy data so important? Well, look at this, right? Here is a table, it's tidy. If we wanna know what is you know, information only for females. It's easy to filter out on sex, okay? We can just say, only give us things where sex is equal to female. If you have untidy data, this is one of the wrong answers from the clicker question, where we don't have a female column, we just have height female and height male, and I guess we just have to know that something that doesn't have an entry in height male, but does in height female is a female. Right? This kind of an operation becomes difficult to impossible, right? Who knows how that works? <laughs> what kind of answer you can get that way, okay? If we want to arrange on rows, we want to arrange by height, okay? With a tidy thing, we can arrange on height. So we go from 
shortest to tallest. If we had untidy data where we had height male and height female, doing that is going to create two separate sorts. It's going to create a sort for height male and a sort for height female where we don't see that there are actually shorter men and taller women and how they arrange with each other. Okay, so that's pain in the butt. What if we want to select and only do a subset of things and arrange on them, reorder on the things we've selected? Okay, so we can select on ID, the first name and sex. Okay, so we sort by ID number first. If there was a conflict within that ID number, then we'd, we would sort on first name and then we would, uh, sorry, this is just selecting, my bad. We didn't get to the reorder bit yet. Okay, so first we can just get those three things only by themselves. And you can reorder that in the order of the columns by changing it from what had been ID, then first name, then sex. We can do it first, then sex, and ID just by changing the order of the argument to the select. Okay? So if we want to reorder stuff on a situation like this with the height male and height female, who knows how we select on sex? We can't really easily. Okay? Say we want to mutate, right? So it turns out that our uh, medical data, they've been assigning patients by ID number to different doctors. So everybody in the uh, 2000 and under on their unique ID is going to go to Dr. Gray and everybody over 2,000 is going to go to Dr. Shepard. Okay, easy to do. We can just assign by this kind of a statement a brand new column. We can create a column that assigns patients to doctors based upon their ID number. Okay, if you had this weird height male, height female situation, well, you would get an answer. That is true. Um, you would get the same kind of nasty data that we'd already had. The operation would work, but you're going to maintain this very poor uh, format for the data by doing that. Okay? So grouping and summarizing, right? What if we want to ask what the average height is? Well, it's pretty easy to do. We can take these numbers and summarize on height. Or we can group by sex first and then summarize by height. So when we do that, we get the mean heights for males and females separately. You can start to see how you can generate really quite complicated analytics very quickly when you can do this combination of group by and summarize. It is probably like the most common operation, I would say, once you have tidy data and you're starting an analysis, you're going to do this without any doubt. Okay, because if your data is untidy, if you have this height male and height female separate columns, you're going to get right. So you always want the tidy data. Okay, so there you have it. That's data wrangling. You've certainly seen detailed examples of a lot of the most common operations and why we care about data cleanliness, why Excel is the work of the devil, why you're going to spend so much time doing this in just a couple of months if you are working intensely at this, you would be able to teach this presentation very easily because this is just such bread and butter stuff. All right. Well, thanks very much for your attention. I will see you all again soon. Bye for now.